next on Secrets of War. In Vietnam, the world's most powerful army struggled to confront an elusive enemy. Viet Cong guerrillas who would strike and then vanish in vast tunnel systems or among civilians. Exclusive interviews reveal the secret relationship between Hanoi and the Viet Cong. Vietnam, hidden in plain sight, is next on Secrets of War. No war in history can easily be described in simple black and white terms, and the American war in Vietnam is no exception. With so many conflicting beliefs and arguable facts, perception often created reality. In a long ago world caught up in the violent struggle between communism and democracy, Truth and fact were routinely manipulated and rearranged in the pursuit of national interests. Vietnam was a bloody war, covered by layers of deception, frustration, and arrogance for both the Americans and the Vietnamese. A startling illustration of this deception was one of the best kept secrets of the war. It concerned a brilliant spin fabricated to conceal the true relationship between the Viet Cong National Liberation Front, a supposed insurgent group native to the South, and the North Vietnamese communist leaders in Hanoi. On the surface, there were two armies, one from the North Vietnam Republic and one from the South Vietnam Liberation Front, and two governments, one from the North and one from the South. But in reality, we accepted that there is only one party, one army, one system of leadership, and one red flag with a yellow star. In 1960, the Southern Viet Cong formed the National Liberation Front, declaring the NLF to be a populist, independent insurgency of South Vietnamese origin, dedicated to a communist revolutionary takeover. The VC, however, were not a popular uprising. Most people in South Vietnam did not support them. It's a great propaganda victory if you can say that this is an insurgency, this is civil war, this was an uprising of the people in the South. Of course, a lot of those people from the Saigon area had actually lived in the North, had been trained up there, were ideologically correct from the North Vietnamese point of view and went back down. So it's not really fair to say this was a complete insurgency war. Armed forces for both North and South were allowed to regroup on either side of the 17th parallel, according to the Geneva Accord ending the French Indochina War in 1954. Many members of the NLF were in fact Southerners who'd regrouped to the North, then secretly returned South as trained North Vietnamese Army personnel. <laughs> I belonged to the Vietnam Popular Army operating in the South. Therefore, I had to be regrouped with my party to the North. When the war was over in 1954, I was regrouped to the North and was acting as a deputy political commissar. In 1962, I received the order to move to Zone B, a North Vietnam secret code meaning to infiltrate to South Vietnam. 
With its own flag and provisional government, the NLF masqueraded as an independent, indigenous Southern Vietnamese movement, fighting a civil war for independence. By 1964, the reality was that 64,000 NVA cadres were operating in the South. The North Vietnamese always referred to the South Vietnamese as puppets of the Americans. Well, they could have also called their Viet Cong buddies puppets, because it's much truer the Viet Cong, the strings were pulled from Hanoi, and the dance of the Viet Cong was choreographed in Hanoi. From 1957 to its formal inception in 1960 to its political and physical disappearance in 1975, the National Liberation Front was a facade, secretly created, supplied, and dominated by Hanoi. Not for the first time and surely not for the last, Hanoi had turned perception into reality. The American government knows more than anybody else that the National Liberation Troops were actually North Vietnamese troops. Therefore, when we hear people now say that the Liberation Army came from North Vietnam, we simply laugh, because that is a fact that nobody denies. Hanoi's ruthless dismissal of all NLF political and military representatives in 1975 has never been admitted inside Vietnam to this day. All of the South Vietnamese that served with the Viet Cong were very quickly discharged. Some of them put in re-education camps with their South Vietnamese enemies and were done away with. North Vietnamese leaders took control. As everyone can see, after 1975, the South Vietnam Liberation Front government just disappeared without any fanfare. No one hears about them any longer, and no one sees the flag once representing them. You ask me if this surprises me. Anyone who lives with an oppressive, totalitarian government must not find this surprising. Anything can happen with such a government. This is a tough lesson for me to learn. The NVA and VC could hide their troops as effectively as they concealed their political objectives. One secret Viet Cong site was a series of underground tunnels located in the province of Kuchi, about 40 miles northwest of Saigon. Needless to say, to enter the tunnel was, of course, not a pleasant thing to do. But there were some conveniences. The tunnel was very long and it had ventilation holes. Upon coming in, we would have an uncomfortable feeling, but after a while, fresh air would bring back the easiness. The Kuchi complex was a 155-mile system which honeycombed the area from the Cambodian border to within 22 miles of Saigon. Begun in 1948, these huge interconnected tunnels symbolized the VC's ability to attack and hide at will. There was no fear if we stayed in the tunnel, even if we could see the enemy clearly. Sometimes we killed them right at the spot when they were visible through loopholes. In the tunnel, we could always go deeper into the ground many meters under the surface. At Kuchi, there could be four to five levels to a tunnel complex. Imagine an apartment house, then turn it upside down. Hospitals, orientation centers, briefing areas, arms rooms, supply rooms, barracks, everything was underground. Smoke from cooking fires was even dissipated through special chimneys. We considered the tunnel as our house, so there was no fear. We could live in there for weeks, and as long as we were there, we believed we would not die. Because not any kind of bomb could reach there. And the same went for enemy soldiers. So there was nothing to worry about. If hidden in plain sight was to sum up the war, it's a perfect title. I could fly over an area 
the aircraft would get shot up, and we'd come back around expecting to see Charlie in the open, and we wouldn't, you know? It just rarely happened. They just would drop out of sight. I know we were right over top of them, but hidden in plain sight is what they were. Despite their ability to hide from their enemies, life in the tunnels and the surrounding countryside was extremely dangerous. The VC were constantly hunted on the ground and from the air. B-52 bombs plowed up everything in Coochie, so it was called Coochie Steel Land. The B-52 was very dangerous because it dropped one bomb right after another incessantly. Shelters were collapsed. Tunnels were cut right at the backbone. It was dangerous because it deeply affected the spirits of our men. The tunnels were virtually impossible to detect unless walked upon. The telltale hollow sound was the only indication of the secret chambers below. For certain American soldiers, known as tunnel rats, following the VC down into the darkness was a frightening and dangerous mission. I would say American soldiers were very brave. For example, the American force called the tunnel rats hunted VC in the tunnel. If they discovered the tunnel lids, they would not hesitate to enter the tunnel to go after us. So it can be called an overwhelmingly brave action, because to do so, they knew they could face death. A VC tunnel could be over 15 meters deep and run for miles. These tunnels were protected by booby traps like punji sticks and bouncing Betty mines. But the best protection for the VC was their ability to hide by blending in with the local populace. There are several reasons for that. The first is political, that the government in the South was corrupt and the people did not support it. The second was that the government invited the Americans in, and that was seen as being an imperialism. And the third, and perhaps most important, was that the will to fight in the North, the, the whole political machine in the North was designed to liberate the South. And the communist machine at that time was one that was very difficult to stop. The leaders in Hanoi understood that a political victory did not require winning on the battlefield. While they respected and were wary of American military power, one of their revolutionary principles of war might best describe their ultimate objective against the United States. If the tactics are wrong, but the strategy is right, battles may be lost, but the war will be won. Lots of people like to say, that uh, the United States did not lose the war militarily. We lost the war. We need to remember that. Whether we lost it militarily or not is a subset. We didn't lose any important battles on the battlefield. If you're talking strictly about military forces in combat with one another. But for a long, long time, we thought that was the whole war. And that was a stunningly wrong judgment. During the Vietnamese New Year on the 30th of January, 1968, under the veil of night and in the midst of a tense holiday truce, all hell broke loose from the DMZ in the north to the Mekong Delta in the south. Communist Viet Cong forces in South Vietnam had launched a coordinated attack they called General Offensive, General Uprising. Within hours, it engulfed 100 South Vietnamese provincial and district capitals. Americans called it the Tet Offensive. It was a defining moment of the war. Our objective was a political objective, to create a new political aspect of the war, so the world can see that not even a strong and well-equipped army like the American Armed Forces can repress a nation when it rises. 
the VC and NBA had been slowly winning the Vietnamese War long before American units landed at Da Nang in March 1965 to prop up the collapsing Saigon regime. By 1967, subsequent massive U.S. buildup of ground units, supported by artillery and jets, had created an expectation of coming victory in American public opinion. Now, with the Tet Offensive, Ho Chi Minh intended to seize the initiative again, no matter how high the cost. I've heard comment that the Tet Offensive was our last big show by the North to try and uh, change the balance of the war. Um, it certainly did did a lot to discredit uh, the American involvement in the eyes of the people in continental USA. I'm not sure, however, that it really was that last gasp of, of, of action from the North. They had the resources to continue. They would have continued. They'd still be fighting today um, if America hadn't withdrawn. The first phase of Tet actually began with a series of attacks in late 1967 in the most remote border areas of Vietnam. These attacks were intended to lure American military power away from protecting the urban population centers and expose the South Vietnamese army to attack. The South Vietnamese soldiers, from my point of view, were never equal to the American soldiers, and neither were their commanding officers. Every time we fought them, they ran away, knowing that they could find refuge in their families. They didn't care about discipline when they lost a battle because their commanding officers also ran away. For seven months, the VC had been secretly bringing arms and munitions into the cities and countryside, pre-stocking the battlefield, as was their established practice. Guerrillas posing as taxi drivers, shopkeepers, prostitutes, even police officers hid themselves easily among the general population. I moved openly, disguised as a wealthy capitalist, driving in a Mercedes car with the chauffeur dressed in the enemy uniform, back and forth, to see if anything had changed in order to modify our plans. They were Vietnamese. All they had to do was walk down the road in anything other than black pajamas, or even in black pajamas, since lots of people wore those anyway, and you'd have no idea that they were, uh, they were on the other side. The VC relied on the support of many local people who provided them with intelligence, with messengers, with assistance in every way. Before we attacked the U.S. Embassy, the young shoeshine boys and employees working there provided us the information about the dispositions of all the guard posts, so we knew everything ahead of time. The unparalleled intensity and magnitude of the attack stunned the American and South Vietnamese governments. No Viet Cong main force unit had ever attempted to attack a city before, let alone all the major urban areas simultaneously. You have to excuse me, but I have to say this. The CIA spies were numerous here. We knew that. But to detect us was quite difficult for them. They could detect big things from the satellites going to the moon, but they couldn't detect our force. The Americans were like actors on a stage in a darkened theater. Everything they did was witnessed by an unseen enemy who was the audience. The Americans finally realized after Tet that they were strangers in a strange land. It was like being on the moon. Uh, we were aliens, and the, and the people no way saw us as the liberators, but down in their hearts, they saw us as the evil one, uh, as the enemy. They did everything that they could to deceive us and to provide support to the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong. The most successful VC assault was at the city of Hue. Two main force Viet Cong battalions, over 1,000 men, had hidden themselves in this graveyard only 300 meters from a South Vietnamese base. Our first objective was the Saigon troops, generally speaking. 
But truly, our main objectives were also the enemy administration systems that domineered the cities and districts. We knew that once we attacked the Saigon troops and these controlling administration systems, the Americans would interfere. So they were also our objective, and our predictions were right. On a prearranged signal, the main force Viet Cong 6th Division attacked and occupied the Citadel a walled fort inside the city, surrounded by a moat. This is the Dong Ba Gate, one of the ten gates of the wall which surrounds Wei's urban areas. After a day of attacking, we occupied eight of these bridges. The battle for Wei lasted for more than a month, and fighting was fierce. The Viet Cong 6th Division finally withdrew with heavy casualties. One year later, secret mass graves were discovered in Wei. While the VC had occupied the city during the battle, 3,000 men and women were executed and buried. Very rarely was it reported that the main tactic of the Viet Cong in phase one was terrorism. And they were not beyond going into a village where the village leader was supposedly supporting the government in the United States, taking one of his children, killing them, and placing the child's head on a post outside the village to let people know of their presence. When we fought for our nation's liberation, we did not spare any opponent. We fought everyone. We are the troops whose function is to liberate the city, observing strictly our rules. We are fighting for the people, therefore we could never do such a thing. However, I repeat, some mistakes might occur during war that we cannot prevent. The communist losses were high. The VC forces had over 65,000 dead during the first phase of their general offensive, general uprising. By the end of the second and third phases in May and August of 1968, they'd suffered 20,000 additional battlefield deaths and many more wounded. Right after the Tet Offensive in 1968, the American army and South Vietnamese army counterattacked and destroyed all the work we had spent 10 to 20 years building up. We couldn't get fresh troops from the South anymore. We had to use troops from the North. All our infrastructures in the South were wiped out. And so the North had to bear the total cost for the war effort in the South. I am telling you, the loss was horrible. Within the Vietnamese Communist Party in the North, there were rivalries. Failed military operations were sometimes used to discredit or even destroy competing factions. Speculation remains about possible secret motives for ordering an attack doomed to failure. This uh, comment has been made that uh, the Tet Offensive was just such an operation and that the high loss of life on the uh, Viet Cong NVA side was not considered to be uh, uh, that serious by Hanoi because it meant a cleansing of the party machine in the South. It's very difficult to be certain. I don't think we'll ever know that because you can be sure that if the records exist, they've been altered. A lot of this uh, is difficult to prove. You get different stories from different people, both inside of Vietnam and outside of Vietnam. But you can safely say that their objectives were many. One of them was to make a wide-scale attack all the way across country to show that the American claims that we were winning were, in fact, not valid. As gunfire echoed through the streets of Saigon and Way, the United States would have to learn the puzzling ambiguity contained in a second NBA revolutionary slogan. 
When the tactics are right, but the strategy is wrong, battles may be won, but the war will be lost. The Vietnam War was unlike any war the American military had ever fought. As powerful as the American military was, it had trained and prepared to fight on a battlefield far different from the rice paddies and mountains of Vietnam. The predominant American strategy was to mass its superior firepower on the enemy through large unit operations. The man who first was the architect of the war who designed the game plan that would be followed for the next eight years, uh, William Childs Westmoreland, was an artilleryman who believed in firepower, who believed in using the same kind of techniques that were employed in World War II, wall-to-wall -wall firepower, and punish the enemy in, in such a pummeling that he will capitulate, he'll run away. And he brought that mentality to Vietnam. The U.S. command strategy was based on a policy of attrition, arrogant in the belief that pure technological superiority would crush the VC guerrillas and the conventional NVA battalions. The Vietnamese were fighting a traditional Maoist-style guerrilla war, as something which uh, has been taught down the years, particularly in Asia, though they, they are very good at doing it, as against the Americans who are fighting a Western a high technology war, which wouldn't have been that uh, out of place in Europe um, in uh, an extension of, say, the Second World War, or if there'd been a fight with the Soviet Union in, in Europe. Vietnam was not World War II, however. Mesmerized by body counts that firepower could achieve when the communists stood and fought, Westmoreland waged a conventional big unit action war in Vietnam with minimal emphasis on civic action. General Westmoreland was sort of a by the book type of soldier. He was in his personal characteristics a proud man one might say a vain man. His approach to fighting the war in Vietnam was essentially that if he killed enough of the enemy, the war would be won. And he killed an awful lot of them, but the war wasn't won. These large American multi-battalion, multi-division sweeps into the remote mountains and deep jungle often allowed the VC and NVA to choose when to fight, usually on pre-prepared battlefields of their own choosing. The impression I think it gave to a lot of guys was that they were hurting us and we weren't hurting them. In fact, we were, but we didn't see that. And Americans seemed to have this notion that uh, the enemy was honor bound to stand up and fight our way. The enemy didn't see it that way. It was, it was quite frustrating. Their intent was not to cause us to be destroyed by one massive shot. They wanted us to bleed to death, and their target was not the soldier in the field or a military objective in the field. Uh, their target was the minds of the American people. American forces learned that finding an enemy when he didn't want to be found was their biggest challenge. The casualties suffered by American forces were substantial, although the NVA losses were enormous. The advantage of the VC is that we couldn't find them. And essentially what they did was wear us down. They would put mines out, blow up a truck, snipe a few people, kill somebody here, blow this up, burn that, mortar the place, and disappear. I kept our casualties high. Guerrilla groups rarely operated in units larger than 12-man squads. They used triple-layer jungle canopy to hide from American aircraft in the daytime. Larger battalions remained spread out in small groups over a wide area and moved at night to avoid detection. We lost many troops and personnel because of helicopters. Definitely America held the high ground on this. But then we adapt ourselves to helicopters by spreading the troops out and by deception. We gave them false indications of our whereabouts. But the main thing is spreading the troops out. 
Later on, we were equipped with anti-aircraft missiles, so we used them for counterattacks or take advantage of forest, mountain, caves, and other natural settings to hide ourselves. The American and South Vietnamese armies hunted their foes by day while the VC and NVA operated at night. Ultimately, it was the civilian population who was caught in the middle. Well, they wanted to survive, and they did what they needed to to survive. Uh, they didn't want to be killed by the Viet Cong. They didn't want to be killed by us. They wanted it all to go away. The average NVA soldier was not much different from any other soldier. He was not a great expert in the jungle, as commonly thought. Most came from Hanoi and Haiphong and other large cities in the north. When he left his home country, he was leaving for the duration of the war. I don't think we, we thought of communism or whatever, but the national, the feeling or the sense of national independence was burning in many, many of us. And many people were not Communist Party members. You remember in this country, you've got only two million members of the Communist Party. The rest were not Communist Party member, but they would fight on and on. The jungle was as new to most of the NVA as it was to Americans coming from Chicago or New York. I've read uh, translations of journals. I've talked to enemy prisoners uh, that were just as scared of the snakes and uh, hated the leeches and all the different adversity in the jungle as much as Americans. Of course, there's one big difference. The American was only there generally for one year. The North Vietnamese came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. He knew if he did not end the war, his children or maybe his children's children would have to continue the fight. One of the unanswered questions from Vietnam remains the actual number of NVA and VC casualties. Malaria and diseases proved to be as deadly as American bullets. I think we lost more men by malaria than by the B-52 or the bomb. My father went to Central Highland and looked at the book there and they list so many tens of thousands of soldiers died of malaria. Malaria had been made worse by the lack of supplies and medicines. The official Vietnamese number for NVA and VC military casualties is 600,000. The American estimate was higher, around 900,000. Both are low. Newly revealed North Vietnamese secret documents and sources inside Vietnam today show military losses of two million dead and millions more wounded. We lost more than two millions in Vietnam War. And in most of the battle, when we went in there, we tried to get the wounded out. But when the helicopters and when the artillery started targeting at the battle, we usually didn't have enough time to remove the dead soldiers from the area. How could any nation absorb such losses? And if American intelligence had known the truth, would it have changed the result? The ultimate explanation may be found in Vietnam's long tradition of commitment, sacrifice, and endurance in war under the leadership of Nguyen Van Giap. Giap is on record as saying, I'm willing to pay 10 to 1, and I know I will wear the Americans out, just as I wore the French out. And so they had decided that the price of their freedom, the price of their independence, would be X number of young men, and they were willing to pay the price. They were willing to fight one hour, one day, one year longer than the Americans. 
this jet plane was doing runs, doing bombing runs and dropping HE on this hillside. This one guy breaks cover and stands right in the middle of the clearing, and he's got an AK with a clip in it. That's all he's got, and his PJs, you know? And here comes the jet on a run, and he stood there until it got within range of his gun and emptied his clip at the jet until the HE hit him on the head, literally. And boom, he was gone. I remember watching this for, from the next hill over and thinking, I, I can't match that. I, how do you do that? How does anybody do that? I wouldn't have stood out in the clearing and shot at a jet airplane knowing it was a death sentence. And the guy in the jet didn't even care. It was like a bug on the windshield of your car, you know, but this guy did it anyway because he was that far into it. It took me years to understand that. If they had an advantage, if they had any single advantage, that was it. Vietnam has a history of resisting foreign invasions dating back thousands of years. The Chinese, the Mongols, the French, and the Japanese had all invaded and been fiercely resisted by the Vietnamese. My father fought the French. And the French came into Vietnam and civilized the Vietnamese. And then the French chopped up rows of heads of resistance soldiers and made it into French postcard. And life under the French colonialism was terrible. So people fought on and on for a hundred years to get them out. And we saw no difference between the French involvement and the American involvement here in Vietnam. Just a different slogan. After declaring their independence from France in 1945, the Vietnamese became experts at modern war, fighting almost continuously from 1946 through 1954. The French Indochina War served as a dress rehearsal for the coming American War. For them, the American War was simply another foreign invasion that would last until the invaders left. It's not like in 365 days, they were going to climb on a plane and go somewhere else. Uh, they were from Vietnam. That was their country. They were going to be there no matter what happened to the Americans. They were either going to be there or they were going to die there. General Nguyen Van Jop's victory over the French at Dien Bien Phu in 1954 was a great source for insights into French tactical shortcomings. It also illustrated Vietnamese tactics as well as their patience and iron determination. Uncle Ho instructed General Giap, if you fight, you must win. If you are sure you can win, then fight. And when General Giap came here, Ho's order of the day was, you must fight to the last person until you die. When a French reporter asked the commanding general of the forces in Vietnam, who was the prime architect of the war, William Childs Westmoreland, said, General Westmoreland, aren't you studying the lessons of the French? And in all of his arrogance, his reply was, who is going to study anything uh, from the French army? They haven't won a battle since Napoleon. As early as 1941, the Indochina Communist Party, led by Ho Chi Minh, believed that there were two ways to advance a cause, by politics or by using force. This was called political or armed Dao Tram. We didn't have the ambition to destroy an army much stronger and way better armed than ours. We wanted to fight in a way to give us a favorable condition to realize our war objectives. Fight militarily, politically, and diplomatically. We had to leave someday. This was a war that for him was not going to be over in five minutes. It was a war that he had been fighting against the French for over 90 years. So what if he had to fight the Yanks for 90 years? He wasn't in that big of a hurry. We were. Where previously in history, the defeat of a nation's fighting forces meant defeat of the nation. Under Dao Tran, if the army is defeated, 
the struggle continues politically. The nation can never be defeated as long as the will of the people remains strong. A mother and her baby were hiding with other soldiers in a trench when the baby began to cry. To avoid giving away their position, she strangled her own child, sacrificing him to save the lives of the other soldiers. One of the biggest debates in the war were the rules of engagement placed on the military by President Lyndon Johnson. He feared if American military operations were carried out in Laos and Cambodia, it would broaden the war, possibly provoking China to intervene. The enemy didn't as much hide in plain sight uh, as it did uh, parade itself in areas that we had placed off limits to our military forces. We allowed the enemy to have sanctuaries that were extremely important to his conduct of the war. I think there's no doubt at all that uh, when you hamstring your, your military and you tell them they can't move over borders even though the enemy is able to do it, uh, then you get not only frustration and a lack of morale, uh, you get tactical disadvantage. You cannot win the game if you can't cross the 50-yard line. That's the story of the Vietnam War as far as I'm concerned. We had a DMZ. We had a northernmost boundary that we could not cross. And any time we chased them hard or hit them hard, they could run across to the other side and be safe. And we couldn't chase them there. And we could send planes over to bomb them, but that's bullshit. New information from NDA commanders confirms that an American ground attack earlier in the war would have severely disrupted the NBA supply effort in the South. According to Nguyen Jap, at that time, North Vietnamese leaders had grave concerns. They were scared that American troops might land and attack at certain places. Then our effort to transport weapons to the south would have been disrupted. Also, a large portion of our troops would have had to remain in the north for defense. It is our priority to defend the north. Since our resources and headquarters were located there. However, for some reason, America chose not to attack. It was President Richard Nixon who finally approved the sending of American troops into Cambodia on the 1st of May, 1970. What should we have done? We should have rolled them up, right up to the Chinese border. There would have been fewer boat people, there would have been fewer deaths, they'd all be riding Hondas and have color TVs and wristwatches now, the economy would be stronger, everyone would be happier. There'd be oil platforms in the China Sea, everyone would be richer and happier, you know? We wouldn't have had to go through concentration camps and re-education camps and all of that incredible bullshit. Southeast Asia would be a booming economy now. The incursion into Cambodia bought the U.S. some time. On a tactical sense, it was successful. But at the end of the day, the Americans still faced an enemy embedded among the civil population. The enemy asked the people, who feeds the Viet Cong? They asked because they did not know that the Viet Cong were the people. And the people feed themselves. As simple as that. South Vietnam was a country in name only. As a nation, South Vietnam was not even the sum of its parts. The South Vietnamese people were much like the Americans under British rule before independence. There were a small core of people that wanted independence. There was a small core of people that wanted to support the communists. 
and there was a much larger group of people. They merely wanted to be left alone. They wanted to farm their rice. They wanted to uh, raise their families, much like people do everywhere. They kind of went with the ebb and flow. Whoever was in charge, whoever had the strength, whether that was the communist or the South Vietnamese, that's the side they supported. The failure of the South Vietnamese army to be consistent in the field, due in large part to its internal corruption as well as U.S. mistrust, became evident as America sought to disengage its ground forces from the war. Our allies were supposed to be the South Vietnamese army, the or of an army of the Republic of Vietnam, which wasn't a republic, but never mind. They were in a, a highly difficult situation. They were drafted by the South Vietnamese government, for which they did not have a great deal of respect, forced into the army and required to fight on behalf of 550,000 white people from outside their country against their own people from the north. They were in a hard place. Again, how would we feel if we were drafted to fight for an invading Asian army in Washington? We wouldn't do it. So they were half-hearted. They didn't know whose side they were on. The country is reflected in its leadership. The invasion of Cambodia, though successful militarily for the U.S., epitomized the corruption at the top of the South Vietnamese army. Military strategies aside, the foremost reason that South Vietnam does not exist today is that it never really existed as a nation, except on paper. As I look around, instead of seeing uh, cannons being taken out of these supply depots and flown back to Saigon as war trophies, I saw Mercedes Benzes. I saw net slung under helicopters with cows in it going back to the, to the butcher shops because the senior leadership of the South Vietnamese armies were not generals, they were businessmen. There's a saying that only those willing to die for their country are fit to rule it. The government of South Vietnam had become insupportable. That was the main reason why the communists were able to exterminate it. I think if you wanted me to characterize the South Vietnamese military political system, I'd say it was corrupt, it was inefficient, it was badly trained, and it relied too much upon its American allies. And there's no doubt that many generals are more interested in the uniforms they were wearing uh, rather than the military tactics. The North Vietnamese suffered two million military deaths, three times that many wounded, 150,000 civilian dead, and 300,000 men still listed as missing. If it was a war of survival for the United States, it would have been completely different, but it wasn't. Uh, it was a war of survival, perhaps for the North Vietnamese, and they certainly took it that way, and that's why in the end, I think they won. The American cost of war in South Vietnam was tens of billions of dollars and over 58,000 military dead, with four times that number wounded and over 2,000 still missing in action. I would say that the, that the, the insurgent had uh, a great many advantages. And the main advantage was that he had the support of the preponderance of the people of South Vietnam. They fed him, they provided him with intelligence, they gave him their sons, they gave him their daughters to be warriors. They were fully supportive of the war as opposed to the American soldier that was in Vietnam whose support base back home was saying, hey, hey, LBJ, how many did you kill today? South Vietnam reportedly lost over a million soldiers and at least that many civilian deaths. There's no estimate on their missing. Vietnam represents the war between two opposite worlds. Communism versus Western democracy. Since back then, the world is divided into two sides. One is led by America, the other by the Soviet Union. As a result of the world's history and situation, North Vietnam ends up on the Soviet side and South Vietnam belongs to the American side.
So I now see us as victims of the world's historical events, and we end up fighting against ourselves. The story is told of an American army colonel in his encounter with a senior North Vietnamese official at the Paris peace negotiations. When the American commented, you know, you never beat us on the battlefield. And the communist official replied without a pause, that may be true, but it is also irrelevant. Invisible in the jungle, shielded by the arrogance of their enemy and enduring losses beyond all comprehension, the NVA and VC had hidden themselves in plain sight. Ten years after American troops landed at Da Nang, 21 years after the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, the Indochina-Vietnam Wars were 